Welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for joining the webinar. So this is uh, Delivering Intelligent Cloud Services. It's really a focus on what, uh, around Microsoft as a platform and what Microsoft consider uh, their advanced workloads. So things that um, aren't the norm, um, aren't uh, your day in, day out, but um, other workloads that they're investing quite heavily in. Um, and this is kind of your some of your cutting edge and on the edge kinds of things. Every customer is going to be slightly different, so I will be using uh, real-life examples of these workloads in the wild with charities and housing where I can, um, but you will need to um, kind of use your imagination a little bit, but really, um, you know, it, not every use case will be exactly pertinent to every customer, even if they're in the same industry. Um, you know, everybody's built a little bit different. You have different environments, different things set up. So again, it's, it's about, um, you know, kind of taking what, what I'm delivering here and then looking at it uh, more around robustly around what you're doing today uh, and then maybe having conversations with uh, with a third party um, you know like ourselves to help you kind of think about the future and about what's possible um, you know and give you some ideas of things that you can do uh, maybe some proofs of concepts that you can run um, so I'll be giving you ideas that, that you know from from a kind of a starting point uh, but again, it would be worth having discussion, uh, you know, with each of you uh, around what's more relevant. Uh, so let's see if I. Okay. So today we're going to be looking, hopefully, to answer these questions uh, to look at uh, the different things. I won't read all the questions, but um, this is this is hopefully what we're looking to get out. Um, the webinar itself, I, I think it's booked as an hour, but really it's only going to be kind of 20, 25 minutes, and then some questions. Uh, we keep these quite short so that uh, everybody's got you know other things to do in the day. Um, but again, like I said, this is more of an intro than an in-depth uh, look at advanced workloads. Those kinds of things happen more on site with each individual customer uh, working with your own environments and what's available. So these are some of the things that we're going to be looking to go through. Um, so the, the advanced workloads that I'm going to be covering today, and there's loads and loads of them out there, but I've, I've specifically looked at Microsoft. I've looked at what they consider the advanced workloads, where they're developing um, different solutions and programs and things around these workloads uh, and really looking to push forward. So the first one is machine learning. Uh, that you'll hear Microsoft talk quite a bit about machine learning uh, and about what it can do and, and how it works. Uh, obviously, artificial intelligence is the, is the big buzzword of the day, uh, and you see that being um, you know, really touted across uh, hundreds of different uh, organizations, uh, and in the uh, I see it on BBC all the time now. So a lot of organizations are talking about it. A lot of the press is talking about it. It's definitely the wave of the future. Now, one of the newer areas uh, that I didn't historically cover that I've now added is mixed or augmented reality, uh, and this is becoming a lot more relevant um, for organizations as a whole. Originally, uh, and still is, is available around Microsoft's, what they call the HoloLens, um, but then Intel's coming out with their Glass version. Google Glass was out a few years ago, uh, and whether or not they re reintroduced that, I don't know. Uh, but there's loads and loads of them that are starting to come out now. Um, and it was based around you having to have this kit to, to kind of use it. I didn't really feel like it was it was enterprise ready at that point. I thought it was it was very hindrant on having that device. Whereas now um, they're you know through a, a lot of the gaming apps which really push this, like Pokemon Go, and I think there's one for Jurassic Park uh, where you use your phone and hold it up you know with the camera you see the real life, but then it shows you uh, bits on there, and that makes it uh, more enterprise ready for uh, the world as a whole because the majority of the world has a smartphone and can utilize that capability without a mass amount of investment on, uh, on kit alone uh, just to make it available. Uh, I, I talk about bots or chat bots. Um, they're, they're basically the same thing, uh, but I focus more on the chat bot side uh, because that's where the enterprises are really looking to utilize bots uh, in that sense of, of replacing customer service and doing chat bots. Uh, and Internet of Things, so obviously all about the devices, and what's going on in there, um, and really kind of focusing on, on that area. So we'll start with machine learning. I'll just give you a little bit of, of kind of high level basics of what machine learning is so that you kind of have an idea of what each of the, 
each of the areas are. So um, machine learning takes things like from a SQL cube or a data lake. Um, it takes a look at, at the trend analysis that you've run and the reports that you've done over time. And it takes all of those and adds them together. And then what it does is it comes out with a take action. Uh, so what you should do next. So it's a very logical step. Uh, a lot of organizations, um, not just uh, housing, not just charities, but fi obviously finance are big, retail's big, where they're starting to take a look at machine learning, go through their environments as a whole, look historically over um, thousands and thousands of, of uh, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes of data um, to kind of get what they should do for the next step, look for trends that they might have missed, um, so while humans can do this on a small scale, you can't really compete uh, with machine learning being able to do it over, you know, a multitude of, of databases, years. Uh, it would take humans, you know, far too long to, to kind of scan through all of that. Um, and we're seeing a lot of organizations looking at doing these sorts of things when you're already running business intelligence reports or doing analysis on, on historical data. This is just helping you get some of those new answers out um, to kind of give you direction of what you should be looking at next. So a lot of housing is using it around um, looking at trends of, of um, your tenants and you know looking at historical trends of tenants and how they're developing and where you should be looking to go in the future. Charities are using it across the board to look at how they should be developing into new areas um, and where they historically have seen success with maybe a campaign or certain things that they've done in the past that have been very successful for them and how can they replicate that for um, generating more funds. So again, it's, it's a little bit of an agnostic um, advanced workload because you know if you're running analysis, you're gonna wanna be looking at machine learning, you're gonna wanna be looking at, at looking at these trends. Now, artificial intelligence is very similar and it gets a lot of the same um, kind of label as machine learning. But there is a real distinct difference between the two. Um, and you know, it still looks at the data, the databases, the data lakes, the trend analysis that you've done, but then it looks at experience. So it looks at the experience that, that uh, it may have over time, uh, and it looks at the emotions, so, which is, is quite interesting. So when you think about uh, artificial intelligence, it's not just a logical app, a, a logical function. Um, I, you know, I like to use the example of the movie I, Robot with Will Smith um, and, you know, the, the robot talks about having feelings, being afraid to die, these sorts of things. This is where you're starting to introduce this, this uh, emotional intelligence to the, to the, uh, to the robotics, to the, to the analysis. Now, what that does is that it looks at things outside of um, just the databases and the logical uh, apps that you've used in the past. It now also starts to look at maybe other areas that may may not be relevant or you thought were relevant, but actually are quite relevant, uh, and makes analysis and adds those in, and it starts to think about um, what those kinds of things can be. Now, a lot of housing is using this in, in many, many different ways, um, and Microsoft has done a great job about helping these organizations around um, kicking out proofs concepts and, and kind of these, these tier one uh, applications around uh, artificial intelligence. And they're using them in ways of like, um, if you think about, you know, you've got uh, a lot of video feeds, so a lot of security cameras on your estates, um, you know, through your public walkways uh, and whatnot. Now, from a, just a generic standpoint, without even looking at, um, you know, the, the data that you're gonna actually be pulling from, from the sense of personal data. So you won't be pulling any personal data, but what you'd be looking at is age, gender, happy, sad. Um, they're working on race currently. So now all of a sudden, just from those four things, you can start taking a look at the analysis of um, who's on the estate, what's the average age group, is it male or female, uh, how many kids do they normally have? Uh, and you can start then targeting those areas when you do your marketing and you start building more and you wanna get more people in, so that you're getting the people in that, that you think will be a natural fit and stay for a long period of time. Um, or, you know, this is a, a lot of disability uh, is being, um, uh, being thrown at artificial intelligence to uh, help with uh, the disabled programs. So, you know, this comes into the charity side as well, but also the elderly side for both charities and housing 
when you're looking at things like being able to um, maybe not have video feeds within the house or within the, the, the house or the apartment or the, the structure, the living structure, but being able to track movement within those areas and then notice when somebody isn't moving for a period of time during the day or during the night, and maybe you need to send a caretaker over to see how they're doing. Um, so there's already housing um, organizations that are doing exactly that uh, for the elderly uh, side of their estates. Um, they're adding in these sensors uh, and then that allows the, the kind of the orderlies to go in and, and check on, on them if they haven't been mobile for say, you know, an hour or two hours when normally they would be. So it looks at the trends and says, oh, you know, uh, Bob generally gets up and moves around. He generally makes a cup of tea between 10 and 11. He generally sits on a sofa between 11 and 12. Uh, today, it doesn't look like he's moved much at all. Uh, you know, he may just be sick or he just may be tired, but having somebody check on him now could end up saving lives or really helping out uh, around that. And around the disability side, the Microsoft's already developing um, things like physical programming languages for children with visual impairments uh, and utilizing AI to help them um, bridge that gap so that they can still do software development without having to see the code per se. Uh, and there's a great, there's a really good video that I've added in, in the end of the presentation. You'll, you'll get everybody get a copy of this, uh, but at the end of it where, um, it's a link to a YouTube video that Microsoft did a couple of years ago about uh, a blind engineer who uh, that works at Microsoft who did uh, a whole program around artificial intelligence and his phone and did uh, whole things around um, not just developing for his job, but just for him getting around. Uh, and he, he tied that into a pair of glasses um, so that he could scan the environment and his phone or his glasses would tell him what's going on in the environment. Um, he did it for things like when he's talking, um, it scans the crowd and tells him if somebody's sleeping or not paying attention per se. So at least he knows where he's gauged at, uh, you know, not being able to see it, but at least he can now say, okay, you know, maybe I need to change the, the, the tone or the format. Uh, and so really it's, it's a really good video. I, I, I really recommend uh, having a look at it. Um, now there's a new program that Microsoft has put together. Uh, and they've just released it. They've invested $25 million. It's a global program, so it's available to all. It's a pot of money. Um, now, what you'll, what this program is, is really looking to utilize uh, and do is, is focused around the capabilities of their artificial intelligent environment uh, and their platform to develop solutions and new ways um, for those that have disabilities um, to engage with the world as a whole. Uh, and this is done uh, by kind of three areas. So the first area is the technology. So that's having access to the Microsoft artificial intelligence platform as a whole and giving you um, that platform to work from, to start from, to develop on. Uh, and this is really, you know, for you to create and test the new environments, uh, but really, really quickly uh, being able to kind of do that, test those applications. The next area is the knowledge base. So you'll have access to uh, engineers within Microsoft that are focused on artificial intelligence, um, you know, architects that are focused on artificial intelligence that'll be able to give you some advice, help you develop your program, um, make some suggestions, uh, all sorts of things. So, you know, I'm, I've tried this and this, they may be able to help you get past, you know, a, a hurdle uh, or say, you know, look, we, we've seen somebody do it this way it didn't really work out, why don't you try doing it this way or changing this and giving you some advice along the way. So again, that's that's really valuable, uh, as well as the partnerships with Microsoft. So you'll get access to kind of the global partners, while obviously, you know, Phoenix can help you with this, you know, kind of from a, from a local standpoint. There may be a global partner that's based out of the U.S. or, uh, you know, all over the world, China, Southeast Asia, Australia, wherever. Uh, Microsoft will go, oh, this is what you're trying to do. This is what you need specialized help in. We know there's a partner located here. We can connect the two of you. And you wouldn't normally, without a lot of research, have that knowledge base or know that. So it's really a great way to get connected with partners that are um, specializing in this area and really advanced in this area. The three areas that, that they're looking for you to um, focus on uh, for the grant uh, is around employment. So helping those that are disabled get employed. 
Uh, now this probably doesn't fit much with the housing side, but probably more with the charity side. Um, but then also uh, daily life. Uh, so obviously this would fit with the housing side. So, you know, creating applications, creating environments um, that, that help those with disabilities. Um, and then uh, communication and connection. Uh, so being able to communicate, uh, being able to connect with other people, go out and connect in, in, in real life, um, not just sit at home all the time uh, because they can't get out of the house or can't get out of their, where they're at. Um, and there's a great program uh, I highly recommend if you haven't been watching it or aren't aware of it um, to go to BBC iPlayer and get some of the, the previous ones um, around, um, and I'm just trying to complete blank on the name, but it's around um, doing advanced technologies for those with disabilities. Uh, and it's really focused around this. So um, they've had the head of um, uh, Microsoft um, that comes up with all of their new programs, uh, that kind of conceptualizes a lot of these ideas. She was on the last week's program helping develop uh, something for a, uh, a child that, that had difficulty walking um, due, to, due to illnesses. But they've done, you know, paraplegics, blind, um, Tourette's, they, they focus on that. And that's really kind of the idea of what this program is for us, is for coming up with ideas to help those sorts, you know, help those kinds of people with disabilities get access to the world. Now, this is something that, uh, this is the link. Again, you'll get a copy of this, so you'll be able to get there. That goes into a little bit more detail about the different areas, and then has a link into the grant program um, application for you to fill out um, and be able to uh, go from there and then Microsoft will be able to kind of advise through uh, what you need to do as next steps. This is for both charities and housing so it's it's really for anybody but uh, it will you know either one uh, will be able to um, apply for a grant. The application just needs to be focused on one of those three areas that I mentioned before um, and it needs to be something innovative um, it needs to involve artificial intelligence um, in, in some way, shape, or form. And this is really something that um, you know we can work with you as Phoenix to kind of help uh, come up with some ideas about what you could do and how to make it relevant. Obviously, you want to make it relevant to the business as a whole, um, but then also maybe we might be able to help get some advice from Microsoft as well. We have a, a great relationship with Microsoft in the UK, uh, and so we might be able to help get some information get some uh, ideas, get some, um, you know, ways that you might, that might help you uh, get approved for the grant. Again, happy to have this discussion with any of you uh, more directly um, and, and go through it in more detail. This is just kind of a high level, but the link will take you to the kind of official page for you to go through. So the next area I'm going to talk about is, is the mixed augmented reality. So this is all really based around the idea of having um, you know, a camera or a real space. So if this is, you know, this is a picture of an empty apartment um, and what you would do, uh, and I've seen that Curry's are now doing this as well. They're allowing you to um, basically take uh, products and then uh, you can input them into the location that, that you're in. So in this case, you know, you could say, oh, uh, how would my TV and TV stand look and what would that look like in the room? Uh, and it may look like that. Now, you, you get a variety of different types of images that you can put on. So this one is very generic, um, and that might be just for you to get an idea of, of spatial awareness. You could have specific pictures like a sofa and how that specific sofa or your sofa would look in there. Uh, same with a chair. Now, again, uh, I don't, don't, don't um, crucify me on my interior decorating design. Uh, I'm not allowed to to pick these things out at home either, but these were the pictures I could come up with. But it's really an idea about how you can engage that space and do things with. Now that's just one portion of it. That's just to give you an idea um, about what you can do in, in kind of empty spaces um, and, and how you can um, engage in those spaces. But the other side is around the uh, repair side. Uh, and again, uh, you know, boilers aren't really my specialty, so I don't, I don't know them in detail. I just found this kind of generic image. Uh, and again, I've included some um, links on the, on the last page um, to some video of an organization um, doing this through, uh, it, they use a HoloLens, you can use a phone, um, just the same. Uh, and it's really quite interesting because what it'll do is 
you you kind of they put the hollow lens on and they take a look at it or you use the phone and you're looking at this this boiler setup and then what'll happen is is the boiler bit will be red that's the bit that's affected you know it's broken in some way shape or form or it's malfunctioning or not working correctly what it may do then is it will highlight in yellow um, the you know the the control box you need to go here you need to check the stats there you need to check what's going on there and then it may say right to start repairs you'll then need and it'll highlight all of these levers in blue and it'll have these little turn sim symbols on to say you need to rotate these count or uh, clockwise to turn all of these off uh, before you can engage the boiler the next thing you need to do as you can see that the boiler plate there on the front uh, has turned blue uh, you know it'll say next you need to find, locate this panel uh, and then you need to remove this panel uh, and then I didn't go any further but you can then say you know once the panel is removed you can get quite detailed about the things that need to be checked changed uh, repaired now this from a housing side is great because what this will allow you to do is is allow you uh, while you may not want your tenants to be doing this obviously it'll allow you to get apprentices and maybe some lower level engineers that can do some of these these fixes uh, and you don't need senior engineers all the time to every event um, or they can take you to a certain stage and if it needs to go further uh, due to checks then a senior engineer will come out now this is also really relevant for the charities that may have um, devices or things that you send out to the field so I'm just Kind of shoot from the hip but if you say you know we've got something that we've sent out to africa to be deployed uh it's been deployed and it's been running but now it's not functioning somebody there with a smartphone can hold it up and show you you can then walk them through a a band-aid or a, a holdover repair until you can send somebody out there uh you know and that may take weeks to get there but at least they're not without that device whatever it may be um, so this is a really great program. I, I do encourage you all to watch the YouTube videos um, to see how people are engaging <clears throat> and how this organization, um, this specific engineering organization, uh, engages um, with the HoloLens, showing them how to kind of walk through these steps. The next area I'm going to talk about, and this is an area that loads and loads of people are interested in, which is bots or chatbots. So if you think about, um, you know, just in general, you, you know, kind of you versus, uh, not versus, but you engaging with the end user, it was pretty direct. It was, you know, you had your users, you had your customer service, they would engage. Now that could be through the phone, could be through texting, could be through the internet, um, but you had, you know, the end users would engage with a live person um, and a lot of times, you know, a lot of the questions that they're asking are pretty basic. Um, where is this located? Uh, you know, from an IT perspective, how do I reset my password? Um, from a charity perspective, oh, I uh, apologize. I don't know why it's kicking me out. Um, from a charity perspective, um, you know, why, um, you know, where do I go to, to make a donation? Those types of things are pretty basic questions. Now, a lot of people have created frequently asked questions to help with that, but then again, they still would engage. Um, and, you know, as everything went global, uh, especially for the charity side, the amount of people contacting you exponentially increased. Now, you could engage and start duplicating your customer service or your, your uh, call center reps uh, physically, you know, with people. Um, and that becomes a very expensive engagement because that, that means training, uh, you know, you're bringing these staff uh, members on uh, and it's just not cost effective. So then you've got people waiting on hold. Um, now from a customer service perspective, that's that's never good, you know, charities, you don't want people on hold waiting to figure out how to give you money. They may get bored and go somewhere else. You know, housing, you don't want people on hold because there may be an actual problem or they may just get annoyed and just hang up and, and then, you know, it, it escalates rather than getting resolved. And so what a lot of organizations are doing is they're taking a look about how, well, how can we engage from a, a basic level? And what they're doing is, is that they're, they're putting in these army of chatbots. Now, this, this doesn't replace people fully. All this is meant to do is, is move those, those 70 to 80% of basic questions 
out of the queue um, so that the more, you know, the more important questions, the more serious questions can get to somebody very quickly to answer. So how this would engage, now uh, Google is doing something voice wise where it sounds like a real person. Um, there's, there's kind of a mixed review on that from people. Some people don't like it. They feel like they're being duped. Uh, Microsoft are doing voice, but again, it's, it sounds like Cortana. It's, it's very, you can hear your Siri or any Alexa. It sounds very robotic. You know, you're talking to a robot, but whether you engage over voice or you engage over uh, instant messaging, the idea is around having, uh, an answer to, and so many answers to each question. Now, what will happen is, is if you take a question of, um, you know, um, who can I call to talk to about X? And there's a series of kind of four responses that chatbot is programmed to give. And it gets down and it goes through all four and none of those were the answer. And it now goes, it needs a fifth answer and it doesn't have it. What it'll say is, oh, uh, I can no longer help you, uh, but my associate Karen can. And now this is where it comes in and becomes important because Karen is a live person. And so now it's been escalated quite quickly uh, from the chatbot who engaged immediately um, and has you know, said that this is, this is needing an escalation and needing somebody to get on this. And it moves it over to Karen or Bob or whoever's sitting on the back end to answer immediately and pick up the phone or respond through instant messaging the answer to the question. Now, what's interesting is that the chatbot stays online in the background and learns that answer. And over time, it uses things like artificial intelligence and machine learning to then pull those answers in. So the next time, when it only had four the first time, it now has five. And every time it passes on, it gains another answer. And so it continually grows its database of being able to answer the more um, you know, basic questions. But the key is, is that it doesn't replace people. What it does is it allows organizations uh, and in fact, there's a, uh, a housing organization uh, that I met um, that has already done this. They've replaced, they had 10 customer service reps in their call center. They've put chat bots in. What they've now been able to do is replace, not replace, they've been able to reuse six of those people into other departments of the organization. So they only have four reps now. Um, their call satisfaction is much higher than what it was before. Uh, and the six people that, um, th that are in customer service or that were are now moved into other areas of the business um, to help out. Uh, this is a great way for, um, for you to kind of reuse uh, people within the organization um, that you, where you may need uh, more help within admin or um, you know, other areas that they may have specialties in or want to grow into. This is a way for them to show kind of career progression as well. Um, so bots are, are really, really important uh, and are being used quite a bit. Now, the other area that uh, I'll be covering is the Internet of Things. So this, the, you know, this is the idea that any, any device that's reporting information back in, so think about smartphones, but you know, also I think about um, the little sensors on just about everything now uh, reporting back. Uh, and so you'll have loads and loads of sensors out there in, in the wild. Um, and there's some estimates saying that we're going to be over 30 billion devices by 2020 uh, that are going to be, you know, able to access through Internet of Things. Um, now, these will report to a Wi-Fi if they're, they're kind of a small sensor. Obviously, your phones will be able to report that over, over the 3G or 4G um, connection. Uh, but, you know, if the sensor doesn't have that, it'll report it to a hub. That hub will then send it up through the internet and into your environment through a firewall. That all gets logged into databases. And really the key for that, and, and, the, and really what that's gonna do is allow you to then report, do uh, reporting through dashboards uh, and offer that to the board to show how things are moving. But it's also going back to, you know, kind of the machine learning and the AI side. You know, you're gonna be able to get the reports to print out and send up to, to the board. You're gonna see trend analysis but you're gonna get be able to get those take action points. And really what's, what's important around that is being able to do uh, loads of different things. So I met a housing organization uh, up in Scotland um, and he immediately saw that he could utilize this, as funny as it sounds, for rat traps. So they've got quite a few rat traps through the estate uh, and they pay a guy who does nothing but goes around the estate every day and checks all the traps. 
what they could be doing and what he wants to do is put a sensor on all these traps so that way they know when they've they've triggered uh, and that means that one that the guy who's going to check all of these no longer has to he only has to go to the ones that obviously have been 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 uh, triggered but that also frees him up and now this guy also has uh, that they've hired has some engineering experience so now he can be used for maintenance which they dire, you know, uh, really need uh, within the organization. So he doesn't have to go and hire somebody else. He can now utilize this guy to pick up some maintenance for the estate. That's great. You can do things like bin cleanup, uh, you know, for bins on the estate. You can do things for boilers to track all the boilers, um, so you can see, you know, when they're on, when they're off, when they're broken before the the tenant may even know about it. You can start tracking parts in the boiler. Um, you can check, you know, for uh, parts in the field for charities, like we we're talking about. If you send stuff out, um, trucks and vehicles. So again, you know, that has already been done uh, through uh, owner, uh, FedEx. So they've done it for their trucks to help with maintenance, uh, and that's cut their cost, their maintenance costs down by millions of dollars a year uh, because they're doing uh, maintenance when the trucks need it. They're not doing it just because they've done 60,000 miles and they think, oh, now it's time. They're actually monitoring the parts going, well, actually that part's still good. And they may get another 10,000 miles and then bring it in. The, the key is that the, the sensors are telling them before it breaks that it needs to be replaced, but it's riding it out to, you know, you using it for 80, 90% of what you can get out of it, rather than saying, oh, we should just change everything at this date. Uh, or this mileage, and it may only be 60% wear, but we just need to change it anyway to help uh, keep the trucks on the road, because that's obviously very important to them. Um, so again, these things can be used in vehicles, engines, all sorts of different things. Uh, and it'll really come down to, and this is why I said it's, it's slightly uh, agnostic, because it'll come down to your organization and what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, Internet of Things isn't for everybody. It doesn't do everything for everyone. Uh, you may not have a need for Internet of Things. It's, you know, there's some organizations that it just doesn't fit. Um, but there's all sorts of ways to use it. Um, housing is really, really interested in picking up on these. Um, you know, the rat trap is just kind of one example. But doing things like uh, we talked about with the elderly and, and disabled care, having sensors um, in the in the uh, the apartment or the house that monitors uh, movement throughout the house. Uh, and being able to track that movement. And then, like I said, the real key isn't, isn't just, you know, being able to track that movement or track, you know, the rat trap going off. It's the information from that. So if you think of something as basic as a rat trap, if you've got 100 of them, but you've got 16 of them that are, that are only ever going off, the majority, you know, 80% of the time, that then means that you've now got, a, you've got the capability to take a look and go, well, actually, I've monitored, and over the last year, these 16 keep going off. What's in that area? What, you know, is it by a garbage dump? Is it a tenant that is slightly messy and needs to clean up the garden? Is it by sewage? Is it, what, what's causing that? So it allows you to then do an analysis over these devices and engage uh, in reporting and feed that back to the business. The business is able then to, to act on these things uh, and do things like provide better customer service, uh, but also provide new services that uh, may not have been there before. Right, so um, these all have um, special environments. And the key, uh, and what's great about this, is that Microsoft has built a hub for each of these. Now, each of these images uh, on, this, on this page um, have a link associated uh, on the back end um, to the Microsoft specific page uh, for each of these areas. So if you click the machine learning picture, it takes you to machine learning on, on Azure. If you click the mixed um, augmented uh, reality, it takes you to the augmented uh, reality uh, page um, set up on Microsoft. Um, it's just a direct link. Uh, so again, these will all come out so that you'll have, but the key around this is that the platform is already built for you. So trying to do this internally with your own uh, environment would be very, very expensive uh, and not very cost efficient. Uh, and very difficult to do because you need a specialist in, say, in artificial intelligence to write all the code, uh, to open everything up. What Microsoft has done is, is allowed you to access a hub, uh, carve out a little chunk of what you need, uh, and use that rather than develop your own. 
this will allow you to open you up to all sorts of partners, software developers, ISVs that are already doing it <clears throat> and looking for something to tie into on the back end to support their, their, their software. And you can tie it right into Azure uh, and start engaging and using. Uh, what this allows you to do is, is your, your time to market and your cost to market is quite low. You're able to do, uh, you know, kind of a, a real basic bots within a couple days. You're able to do a real basic artificial intelligence environment or solution within two, three days. Um, this really accelerates the capability of what you can do and what you can go to market with. Now, when I say basic, they are really basic. But what that, that allows you to do is create a proof of concept for the business to go to them and say, right, it costs us X amount of money. Um, I mean, it, they're not, it's not cheap. I mean, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, and it took us this many days. If we make this a real project and you fund it, this is what we could be doing. So it just allows the business to start taking a look at these solutions and what they can actually offer you from an organizational standpoint. So that kind of ties into the are you ready side. Um, <clears throat> because it's a hub and because it's already pre-set up, it allows you to um, very quickly access it. You don't need your own environment because you can engage Microsoft's. So from an are you ready perspective, you may be looking about how you're, um, <clears throat> you're developing your own internal environment, but really this is gonna allow you to run this in parallel. And this is gonna give you the capability to run it in parallel so that it doesn't affect what your, your normal day-to-day -day, uh, projects may look like. This is great um, because this allows you to run this in parallel, but to the side. So you know the users aren't affected, the business isn't affected, but the output, you can very quickly start showing value to the organization with. So next steps, uh, and I'll go through these quite quickly because um, we've gone on a little bit longer than I expected. Um, but when you look at what's available from Phoenix, so obviously, you know, the next step may be a conference call or a face-to-face. -face. Um, you know, myself or, or my boss, uh, Craig uh, Taylor, can come out and spend some more time talking about Azure as a whole. Or we can focus on the advanced workloads and go into more detail, look at what you're already running, and start giving you, you know, kind of giving you some ideas of areas you could look into, talking about some of the areas that may be more relevant to you uh, and how that may affect, uh, you know, what proof of concept or where you want to look at in the future. We run two programs, uh, one's called Fundamentals and one's called Surveyor. Uh, now they're both slightly different, uh, obviously in the in what they they do. So. Fundamentals is you've decided uh, from a whole that you want to go into Azure, whether that be for your infrastructure, for advanced workloads, for whatever, uh, your databases, you want to put them into SQL Azure, but you need to run a proof of concept around that. We, we work with you. We build that proof of concept out. Um, we then re, um, we kind of build a report around all of that to give back to you so you can supply that to the business and go right. You know, we've done our due diligence. We want to move to Azure. This is what it would look like. Here's the costings. And, you know, this is the time frame it would take to get us there. So it's really focused around doing a proof of concept and report for that proof. Surveyor is really for those that um, you may not know what you need to do or where you want to start. You may be early days and want to start building a business case uh, for over time. Uh, and so what you would look at doing then is, is, is Surveyor would give you an agnostic approach. We don't care if you're running VMware Hyper-V on-premise or hosted or somewhere else. We don't care if you want to go to the cloud on-premise or um, any of the cloud vendors. What we do is we gather all that information. We then tell you what can and can't move to the cloud. We then build a report as a whole that you can, you know, kind of a future plan report. And that gives you a really clear idea of what you need to do as next steps, uh, what can move to the cloud quickly, what can move to uh, a platform rather than just an infrastructure as a service, uh, what you can pick up as a software as a service, all of those sorts of things with some costings around that. Uh, and then the key bit will be the, the money, but also the time. So, you know, to make this transition, you know, we, we estimate your migration will take six months um, and this much effort. 
and we can work with you on how much of that you want to go through us, through you, through another partner, whatever. So those are kind of the, the few programs that we do. Um, they all start with a conference call or face-to-face -face, uh, to discuss further. Uh, but you know, I encourage you to engage your account manager. Um, I've, I've got, you know, I'm happy to travel uh, all over the UK uh, and do. So I'm happy to engage uh, wherever it makes sense and, and to meet with whomever. Um, now this here is the useful links that I've put together um, just so you have them. Um, and so that you're able to, uh, these are the YouTube videos at the bottom, but then some of the, um, the websites as well. Um, but this will allow you kind of quick links into, into those. Uh, and that uh, concludes the webinar. So I've thrown quite a bit at you uh, and I've covered quite a bit. Um, so I'll open it up if anybody's got any questions or wants to go through anything. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer anything. Or if you want to um, engage your account manager and then um, set up a conference call, happy to do it that way as well. Uh, right. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I'm just looking through. Okay, doesn't look like it. Um, let's go check it one more time. Uh, what I will say is that um, we will be sending out a poll uh, or a questionnaire uh, afterwards. Uh, please do, if you have, it only takes a couple of minutes, but please do fill it out. It helps us gauge, um, you know, whether you enjoyed it or not, but also uh, if you found it relevant, if not, if I need to change some things, and also areas that you'd like to see that I can build, you know, future webinars around, whether that be kind of storage or networking or anything within the cloud. Um, I can start looking at, you know, webinars for the future. So um, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, I'm glad that you came on um, and I look forward to talking with each of you further around uh, advanced workloads in the cloud.